For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jen Bradley. I'm the director of reunions at Mercersburg. I graduated um, in 1999. And I wanna welcome you all here tonight. We have nearly a hundred members of our community who signed up to be here um, from the classes of 1945 to 2018. Uh, alumni, current parents, faculty. Uh, so it's a wonderful group and, and thank you. Uh, we're gonna hear tonight from Doug Smith, who is our school archivist about the history of the Edwards Room, which is one of the most iconic spaces on our campus that has served many purposes over the years. Uh, Doug has been at Mercersburg Academy for 14 years. And as I said, he's the school archivist. He's also the head golf coach and a parent to Cole, Mercersburg class of 23, and Nora, Mercersburg class of 24. And his wife, Jen Smith, is Mercersburg class of 1997, and she is the Dean of Academics. So dedicated in 1900, the Edwards Room uh, inside of Kyle Hall was Dr. Irvin's first foray into bringing Gothic architecture to Mercersburg Academy, starting a decades long movement of inspiring by design through the buildings of campus. It has served at various times in our history as a dining hall, a library, a performance space, and a student lounge. So tonight for your viewing pleasure, Doug is going to share a lot of photographs with us. I would recommend if you go to the top right of your Zoom, um, you can choose a side-by-side -side speaker view or you can choose not to watch Doug and just focus on the pictures. But I just wanna make sure you know where those controls are. We ask that you remain muted throughout this presentation. There will be a few moments when Doug will ask for uh, your input and there will be a chance for Q&A toward the end. Though if you have a question, you can type it into the chat or um, Denise, is that an option we can do chat? That's right? Yes, if you correct. Have. Okay, wonderful. And we are, as, as you may have noted at the beginning, we are recording this session. So if you're uncomfortable being on camera, feel free to turn your camera off. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Doug Smith. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, like Jen had said, I got a pretty big presentation I'm gonna share with you guys. Uh, we promise at this, you know, one hour from now at eight o'clock, this will be over. So. This isn't gonna be short. I'm not terribly concise when I tell stories. I did my best, but this is gonna be pretty long, but I, in one hour, this will all be over. So let me go ahead and get this started here. And Doug is coming to us from the Edwards room. I, I, I should have said that. You may have noticed the, uh, the mantle behind him. All right. All right, guys. Well, welcome to my Edwards Room talk. I have done some variation of this on campus tours, or I'll informally grab an innocent bystander and explain some detail of the room. And they just kind of nod approvingly and leave. Um, but not you guys, you know, you're here of your own volition. So with that in mind, this is not going to be an intro level Edwards Room talk. This is going to be more of an advanced study talk. Um, and because I'm literally 20 yards from Rutledge Hall that houses the English department, I'm going to gain a little inspiration for this talk from uh, Archie Rutledge himself, as he was called. Archibald Rutledge was a storyteller of the highest order. Um, when pushed on his rambling nature of stories, he responded with this quote, most men, they will tell you a straight story through. It won't be complicated, but it won't be interesting either. So in kind of honor of Rutledge Hall and Archie, I'm going to try to make this interesting and not just informative. So, you know, do you ever, there's a few places on campus when I walk into them and right from the start, I feel like something's happened in this room and I'm not even sure what it is. It's like a sense of purpose or a deeper meaning to a room. And you know, just a few places on campus. I think Trailer has that when you go into that great room, the chapel, Noldy has that, Bergen has that also. And I feel like those rooms kind of make you feel a little something special. And honestly, I think that's why we're all here. I mean, maybe you're here to hear me talk. I doubt that. Maybe you're here to see the Tiffany windows, but I think we're all here because when we go through the Edwards room, we, we feel this sense of uh, inspiration. And I actually think that's very intentional by the way this room was designed. 
I don't think rooms are built like this anymore. I, I do not mean that you can't hire individual craftsmen to work on every aspect of your room. You can do that, but it's very expensive. Um, and it's just not common. And when this, this room was built, this room was built with a philosophical idea, uh, a movement in mind. And that's the exact type of thought that Dr. Irving had for all of our early campus. Um, the trimmings, the trappings, the architecture, the purpose of, of this architecture in this room is to make us all inspired to uh, something above us. Uh, it's often said that Kyle Hall is Dr. Irvin's first building, which is actually not correct. It's his third building. Does anybody have any guesses what his first two buildings are? I'll take a couple of guesses. You can unmute if anybody thinks they know the first two buildings Dr. Irvin built. 88. Close, that was in 1903. So that was right after this. Built, built by the same guy who built this room, by the way. Laux. Um, Laux is not right either. Laux was further on down the line. Main Hall. What's that? Main Hall. No, old Main Hall was our oldest building. New Main Hall was in 28. I'll give a couple more guesses. Jim. That that was a little bit later. So the the what we're gonna trailer. That was even, that was even a little bit later. Um, Bounce? Neither of these buildings are still standing, so that's going to make it tough for you to know. One is kind of standing. It is this right here, which is the annex to Main Hall. It's now swank, and it's in a different form. Um, it was built shortly after Dr. Irvin arrived. It housed uh, sort of where they had chapel procedures and they had school meetings was in Main Hall annex. And then the next is this little building right here, this small little building called the Cage, which was our first gym. And it's roughly where the high jump pit is right now. What I love about this is you can see McFarland Road going down the left there. And that's the Nevin house or the pest house as it is referred to. So that whole area now is where, where Noldy has been built. And this was built right before Kyle Hall was built. And I'm always shocked that there is no trees. But I think the reason that Kyle Hall is so often referred to as his first is because it was the first that he made with this vision that he wanted the campus to involve into. It's important to remember that from the very beginning of Mercerburg, the campus buildings were linked with student needs. The first two buildings were absolute necessities. And by the time Cal Hall was built, frankly, it was a necessity also. The school had grown from 40 students in 1893 to 205 entering the fall of 1900. The school was growing rapidly and to put these numbers in perspective, by the fall of 1903, the school had grown to 327 students, making it the fourth largest boys boarding school in, in the nation at that point in 1903. So this dorm was necessary and a new formal dining hall was necessary to accommodate those students. And at this point, Dr. Irvin had gotten the strong economic footing that would be needed to create a building of this stature. Remember, in 1893, Dr. Irvin inherited a school with $5,000 of debt and no endowment. And by the time in 1900, when this building was built, he had that, that treasure chest where he could start to really work um, his, his vision. We often look at Dr. Irvin as his great visionary, which he was, but that vision he had was not created in a vacuum and was most likely informed by experts in the field that he knew personally, field of architecture. And I, I think to understand what was going on in this room, why this room is so ornate and made the way it is, you need to start with some historical context. And I'm gonna take a bit of a deep dive into this, but as I went and went further and further, so I'm gonna be concise and I'm probably gonna mess this up for any sort of cultural art, you know, architectural historians in this area. Um, I wanna give some credit to the research done by a professor from Franklin and Marshall, his name's Costas Corellis. And he came here and visited researching blueprints for the chapel. And I took him on a tour of the campus and he was enchanted with this room. Uh, I explained to him some of the craftsmanship that went into this building. And he went into this long dissertation about the arts and craft movement of the late 1800s and early 1900s that this room is associated with. There's a leading philosopher and sort of the intellectual underpinning of this. His name is John Ruskin, and this is him right here. 
He uh, was an art critic of the Victorian era. He was a social thinker, a philanthropist, an artist himself, a son of a leading wine merchant in London. So he had, he had some time on his hands to ruminate about the fate of 19th century England. As the Industrial Revolution raged on, more and more things were mechanized, trade, manufacturing, to push the craftsmen and tradesmen of previous generations of the Middle Ages out of work. And Ruskin felt that not only was the beauty of society degradating, but also the appreciation of nature, and most importantly, the lives of individual workers were ceasing to be sustainable. His theories strove to combine his notion of art, society, and labor. <clears throat> he placed value on the joy of hard work and the beauty of its efforts. Basically, he believed a life centered around more individual hard work and a more artful living environment would, would literally be morally uplifting to people. Ruskin's book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, was a leading text that shaped the arts and craft movement going forward. His teachings caught on by the mid 1880s and became an international movement. Ruskin influence was far and wide. He got praise from everybody from Leo Tolstoy who described him as the most remarkable men, not only of England and of our generation, but of all countries and all times to Gandhi who proclaimed his theories to be the advancement of all. So Ruskin was the philosophical underpinnings of this and the, a very important figure and probably most important to our room is a man named William Morris who was a tapestry textile worker and he was a poet and social thinker, but he was a man of doing. He was a skilled craftsman of the type that used to work in the Middle Ages. He worked largely in wallpaper and design and like uh, fabric for furniture. He, uh, he was informed and inspired by Ruskin and he put this way of thinking into action. His workshop was run as a traditional medieval guild. He despised mechanical machinery and demanded that everything they put was done by, everything they output was done by a tradesman. Here's a quote that I really like of his, nothing should be made by man's labor, which is not worth making, or which must be made by labor degrading to the makers. As time went on, he really focused on the interiors of rooms, from the furniture to the wallpaper. His designs influenced a generation of, of decorators and had influence here on our campus. If you look at things like this, which is the first Merseburg lit I have in the archive from 1901 and the songbook, which had all of our hymns for the chapel and school songs in it. If you look at the patterns, they're, they're very similar to the type of patterns William Morris brought back in the style. Also, John Ruskin was a, a big believer in this type of architecture. And in fact, that professor at Franklin and Marshall taught a class on this book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture. And this was the cover for his syllabus was our mantle mixed with the cover of, of Ruskin's work. So that is the environment of design that was going on in 1900 when this opened. And this was what Dr. Irvin was so attuned to. And this is what he wanted to impose on our campus. But I talked about funding because this, this is truly an amazing room. And even then getting tradesmen and craftsmen to carve and do the stained glass was an expensive undertaking. Um, this school was funded in large part by a $45,000 gift of Jacob Kyle. In today's dollars, that's 1.375 million. Now, I've heard varying reports on if he donated 45,000 or the whole building did. I'm not sure. The history that we have says he donated $45,000. This is an interesting find that I'm sure, I, I doubt anybody has ever seen this picture besides me, but here's a picture of Jacob Kyle that it was here in 1869 to 1871. Um, he was from Pittsburgh. He's graduated Merseburg College at the time. After graduating, he moved to Colorado. He had interests in gold and silver mines in the 1870s. Um, tracking down how JT spent his time was very difficult, but by the time this dorm opened and he made the donation in 1900, he's working for a textile firm with his father in Pittsburgh. His gift went to the overall construction, but more pointedly, it went to the creation of the Edwards Room. This is opening day Kyle Hall in 1900. Again, zero trees. It's just amazing to me. Um, Kyle Hall itself, okay, this is to be known that the Kyle Hall itself is designed in the colonial style by a man named M.R. Rhodes from Chambersburg. 
However, Dr. Irvin called upon an old college buddy from Princeton that was an architect. Um, he often called on old buddies to, to finance things on campus. I'm sure people were leery of opening a letter from old, old man Irvin, but time and time again, they all came to his aid. So he, he had a lot of influence with them. The buddy I speak of is this guy here. His name's John Houston. He was, uh, he was a major architect of the time, had several major commissions. And after some back and forth debate, they decided on a baronial Gothic scheme for the interior of this room. Uh, it was originally thought to possibly be a Greek interior, but the sort of neo-Gothic architecture went in line with the arts and crafts that went into making this room. And, and they decided on the baronial Gothic. And he was given free reign over the design of this room. Uh, which might not have been actually the best idea. Um, but incidentally, remember those songbooks, the, these right here, uh, he actually designed these. Joseph Houston, the designer of this room for Merseburg designed the Litz first cover. And he actually had to enter a contest for the songbook and it was against students on campus. And he won in 1901 and he got to do the cover of the songbook. But at the time, right in 1901, he was also putting in a bid for a much, I guess a much larger commission and that is the state capital of Pennsylvania. Uh, Joseph Houston, if you've ever seen the capital of Pennsylvania, it's amazingly ornate and gorgeous. It's uh, one might say it's extravagant, borderlining on gaudy, but it's absolutely every nook and cranny of it is is something to behold. In fact, when my wife was running a marathon a few years ago, I took my kids because it was a long marathon. It was like 12 miles out, 12 miles back, and you couldn't really watch. So we went up to the state capitol. It was a Sunday and it was, we weren't able to get in, but we were able to walk around the outside. And this right here is covering the lock is a, that is a iron, you know, a hand done iron lock cover of Joseph Houston's face. You literally have to like take his face. That's my daughter and me open it up. You have to take his face to get into the chapel and open it up. These types of little things were done all over the chapel or the, the capital. And in fact, he went a little too far and he was brought up on charges of graft for charging four or five times the amount he quoted to build a capital. In fact, it took six years, but starting in 1901 to 1906, he was, he was found guilty and actually sent to prison for graft of on the Capitol. Um, but during that time, he built the Edwards Room, Old 88, and designed the cover to the Lit and the Songbook. But now back to Kyle Hall here. Um, interestingly, Kyle Hall is not named after JT. It's named after his mother, Sarah Salome Kyle. Here's a portrait of her that at various times have hung in the Edwards room. This is a complete aside again, but these are the rabbit holes of Merseburg history that happened when I decided to research things. But I researched Sarah and I searched through all the publications of the school and I found this, which is the February 1901 Stony Batter picture, just a few months after Kyle opened. If you look right in the middle is Sarah Kyle with a miss in front of it. it you know, and it's not that common of a name. And if you look close up, this is a close up of her here. Uh, you know, I, I can't guarantee that this is our Sarah Kyle of Kyle Hall, but you know, how many Sarah Kyles are there? How many of them have ties in Merseburg? How many of them just had a brand new building named after them? So I'm at, I'm at least 80% sure that Sarah, the namesake of this building, performed as Clara Carew in the February 19th, 1901 spatter production of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But as I said, back to the portraits, um, which is one of the major features of this room in Dr. Irvin's original design. Um, if you've ever come to my archive on the bottom floor, you'll notice it's lining. It's a hall of portraits, I call it. And that serves as two, two purposes. First, we needed a place to put all the portraits, which were spread out all over campus in closets. And two, I was recre recreating in my own little way, Dr. Irvin's vision for this room. In fact, 
there's still remnants of the portrait collection hanging in here. But instead of me outlining what Dr. Irvin intended uh, the portraits for, I'll just read an excerpt of the unveiling of the Henry Harbaugh portrait. Portraits stand for something. And this is him standing in Cal Hall saying this. Portraits stand for something. They depict the genius and life and worth of those who have made themselves worth of being honored. Here he points to the James Buchanan portrait. Mercersburg's men have risen from the humblest beginnings to place honor, dignity, and trust in church and state. What does that portrait of Mr. Buchanan stand for? It stands for court life, the highest principles of statecraft. There, as he points to the other side of the room, is General Mercer. Who is he? An exile driven from his home in Scotland, settling in Mercerburg. He was the first physician in this section. That portrait stands for liberty and self-sacrifice. There hangs the portraits of Apple and Higby. Who were they? Intellectual giants, scholars, theologians, holy men of God. They stand for the beginning of things to which there will never be an end. My friends, we shall shortly have a hall of art of Mercerburg. It is to keep before our eyes and our boys in concrete form, the achievements of men and the purposes underlining these achievements. We shall place before our boys only those who live, whose lives contain lessons of courtesy, courage, honor, and loyalty. And you know what I find interesting about the Hall of Great Mercerburg People, otherwise known as the Hall of Great Men for a period of time, is that there's very little talked about Sarah Kyle's portrait here. It wasn't, there wasn't a big unveiling like there was in a couple of the ones I'm gonna talk about. And, and what's fascinating about this is Dr. Irvin was good friends with a man named Henry Mitchell McCracken, who was a chancellor of New York. And Henry McCracken actually created a hall of fame of great Americans in Bronx, New York, which is still there. It's on the Bronx Community College grounds. He coined the term Hall of Fame, as a matter of fact. It was made exactly when this hall was built in 1901. And Henry Mitchell McCracken donated Sarah Kyle's portrait to the school. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think the two of them were in cahoots on the Hall of Great Men and the Hall of Mercersburg folks. But today, we have four portraits hanging in Kyle Hall. And this is the namesake of the room, Dr. Boyd and Francis Edwards. Their portraits were painted by Jerry Wickwire. Wickwire was a protege of William Merritt Chase, which will be interesting in just a moment. And they were both paid for and presented by organizations of students on campus, the Class Memorial Committee for Dr. Edwards and the Mercerburg News Board for Francis. I'm truly happy this room is named after Dr. Edwards. He was our second headmaster. And due in large part, he, the respect he had for Dr. Irvin, he came here after being a headmaster at Hill and when he came, it was a difficult time in our history, he inherited a good bit of debt. The Great Depression was raging through his time here. But due to a vigilant conservatism and, and really, truly strong leadership, he brought the school through that. And by the time he left in 41, it was in a much better place. One of his early speeches on campus, this, uh, you guys will recognize this, he, uh, he was quoted as saying this, which I think sums up sort of his beliefs in line with Dr. Irvin's too. We have a popular saying that boys will be men, or sorry, we have a popular saying that boys will be boys. We used to excuse kiddish mischief and adolescent pranks. That should not blind us to the equally true aphorism, boys will be men. The kind of men they will be depends on the patterns they choose and the patterns they choose will be formed after the men they like. That type of philosophy of being a role model and inspiring people is funny. I think that's carried out through Mercerberg's time here. Katie Titus actually says often a quote that something along the lines, I might mess up a little bit, but be your best when everyone's looking and when no one's looking. And, and I think that is the idea that Dr. Irvin and, and, and Doc, Dr. Edwards put forth was not only are they going to be role models, but they're gonna have things for the students to look around and see role models and be inspired. So let, let's get back to the portraits here. The, the first, the other portrait hanging here is uh, Thomas Alexander Scott. And this one is an actual William Merritt Chase portrait, um, not his protege's work. Thomas Scott was probably best known as the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, for better or for worse, actually. I'll let you read your own history on that one. 
He was also Abraham Lincoln's assistant secretary of war during the Civil War. Now, the final portrait we still have hanging is James Buchanan. And, and this portrait is fascinating to me uh, for a number of reasons. It's also a William Merritt Chase portrait, but it was given to us uh, and paid for by Harry Lane Johnston, who is James Buchanan's niece and was also the first lady. If you remember, James Buchanan was the bachelor president. Harriet Lane became a leading lady in Washington, D.C., both during her presidency, during the presidency and afterwards. And the term first lady actually is in reference to Harriet Lane. She became the first lady of the White House. That's where that term came into being. So in 1900, she had a very large art collection. Her and I believe it's the Mellons, uh, when they died, their, their collections became in large part the National Gallery of Art in America. But Harriet Lane knew many of the leading Impressionist artists of the time, and she was a fan of William Mary Chase. So she went to him and had him paint this portrait. What's interesting is not only is James Buchanan's presidency rated rather low, his official White House portrait is also rated as one of rather low in the in the portrait rates. And this is it. Um, Harriet Lane always hated this portrait. She thought that it it showed Buchanan in a light that she didn't like. So when she unveiled this in 1901, which was the last time she came to Mercerburg, actually, she was so enthralled with it that she uh, had a copy of it painted and it replaced that portrait in the White House. The one on the left is the White House presidential portrait. The one on the right is the one we have hanging, the original we have hanging in the Edwards room, which I think is pretty fascinating. All right, so here we are 25 minutes into my talk and I have not even touched upon probably the two most inquired aspects leading up to this of this room, which are the gorgeous wood carvings and this amazing mantle behind me and, and of course the Tiffany windows. So let's, let's start in on that. We have 16 hand-carved shields of the leading European universities. In fact, many of these universities did not have crests and Dr. Irving got in contact with chancellors in, in their country and they sent us seals. Some were handwritten artists, like what they would like them to be. And th these were all carved. Every ornamental piece in this room was hand-carved by a guy named William Russell except the panel behind me above the fireplace. William Russell did the wood carvings for a company called Cramp and Sons out of Philadelphia. There are two major hubs in the United States where arts and crafts really took hold and spread throughout Great Britain. Philadelphia is one, Boston is another. That's not the only places, but they're the major hunts for artisans. And that is where Russell worked out of. When you look at the small touches that line the room, even just these little roses that dot all along the wood, every one of them is different and hand carved on site here. There's no machine molds. And you can tell because there's minute mistakes, like the lines are not perfect on one to the next. One has three ripples, the next has four and so on. They set up on campus for three weeks, William Russell did, a, an on-site woodworking shop where him and his workers did all the carving for the, the entire room, everything on the mantle, everything you see, and they're all little works of art. Uh, here's a few of my favorites. This one here is, this is about a three inch piece I, on the Cambridge shield. This one here is the Aberdeen shield. And just to show you some of the detail that these have, you see in the lower left, those three little dragons or wolves, each one of those is about an inch and a half and each one of them is different. Um, they all, every little bit ha has, has a little different aspect to it. It's the more you look, the more amazing it is. And what's kind of cool about this, actually is quite cool about this one Aberdeen is a guy who gave it is a guy by the name of Richard McGran. He was in the class of 1894. This is the first class of Mercedesburg. There's Richard McGran on the right. He's in the left over here, kind of left center. Richard McGran is known as the original Mercedesburg boy. He later became a horse breeder 
at once convinced the king of Italy to use his horses of, of his breeding alone for their army, and they did. They shipped all of the horses for the entire Italian army over from Magrand stables. However, he was also Dr. Irvin's roommate in 1894. <laughs> Richard Magrand was the first PG we ever, ever had on campus. And that's kind of why he's known as the first graduate. There's other kids who graduate in this class. Not only was he first PG, he was the first person that Dr. Irvin secured to come to our school. And he's the only alum of the Academy to donate a window and a shield, a window or a shield. Uh, by the way, all the shields are donated by Princeton alums. Uh, they're all friends that Dr. Irvin knew from Princeton. Now, the piece behind me um, at the time of its installation was reputedly the largest, and, and, and I don't know if this is true, but the largest single carved relief it, effective in, in the world. It, uh, I, I know now the Guinness Book of World Records tells me that the largest single carved relief is 13 meters long and is in a Beijing museum, but it's still a massive feat. And at the time, maybe it was. It was carved on site. It took three months and it was carved by a different person than William. It was carved by a guy named John J. Maine. And Maine came from a long line of wood carvers with his uncle being the most famous and a leading ecclesiastic wood carver. Edward Maine is his name. John was his apprentice, worked in his shop from a very young, young age. But what makes this particular piece of work so important is not just who carved it, but that it was made from a plaster mold that was designed by a guy by the name of Alexander Sterling Calder. Some of you may be thinking, I've heard that name before if you're into art, and even if you're casually into art, you might know that name because yes, Alexander Calder, the famous artist of the mobiles that you see in modern art museums around the country, this was his father who created this. And this Calder was actually a very famous artist himself. He did the Swan Memorial Fountain in Philadelphia if you've ever seen that, the Leif Erikson Memorial in Iceland, he did sculpting on the Washington Square Arch in New York City. And also interesting is this is, there is a duplicate of this also. This right here is the architect of this room's den, John Houston. He is home called Oaks Cloister, Oaks Cloister in Maine, and it's on the main line in Philadelphia. He had up on his mantle there, a carved boar hunt. Um, the detail of this is fantastic. The closer you look, the more amazing it kind of gets. Uh, I particularly like this with the sun in the background. It, if you're wondering what the boar hunt's meaning is, it's, it's the advantage of education. And I think that goes in with the theme of this room of higher education being abounding and men of intellectual strength lining the room. But it, it depicts an educated lord of the manor enjoying the thrill of the hunt. He's the one on the horse and its rewards while the unsaddled, uneducated farmhand rise in discomfort. I never fully grasped uh, the deep meaning of that, but uh, you know, that, that's, that's, what it, that's what it stands for. Uh, a little story here would be good. As, as you all probably know, and many of you on this call know it as this, this, uh, this space was our dining hall for you know, the better part of 65 years. It's where students gathered to eat. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine, but they actually put 500 people in this room and it, it seemed to work very well. Notice all the white coats serving throughout the room. Here's a picture of 1945. And the reason I kind of find this interesting is our, our most senior alum, George Price from the class of 45, uh, this is his class. And, and, and maybe afterwards, I wonder if George can recognize any of his buddies in, in the class of 45 there. Um, but, you know, notice all the white coats. I got an interesting white coat story from the time. Um, and the story was in 1926, Harry von Strainen, the story of Harry von Strainen. He was one of the white coats. And after a meal, he, along with the other white coats, were cleaning up in the dining hall and some level of a food fight broke out. 
Well, one thing led to another and a potato was thrown across the room and smashed right into the ornately carved boar's hunt behind me, breaking the spear that the guy has buried to spear the boar. The Senate and Dr. Irvin knew Harry was involved. They weren't sure he threw that potato, but they knew he was involved and, and knew that he knew the other players involved. So I have in the archive a letter to the Von Schreinens detailing out not only the incident, but how Harry's grades are struggling, how difficult that must be for the parents of, of, of the child. And if he could just get off his chest, it, he would be so much better off, you know, if he could have this burden lifted off of him. Well, I don't know if Harry ever got it off his chest, but what I do know is there is no record of Harry Von Strynen or any Von Strynen for that matter in our database, not even in our trade cards, which are the holy grail of old school record keeping. It's like Dr. Irvin completely wiped him out of existence. I can't even find a record of the Von Strynens in the town that the letter was addressed to. They're, they're simply gone. Moral of the story is, you know, don't mess with Dr. Irving. But to keep, uh, oh, and here's a picture. You can kind of tell if you look closely, the spear looks slightly newer than the older oak. Um, a lot of the reason this oak is dark, just so you know, is that's, that's tobacco tar from generations of cigarettes, pipes, and cigars. But if you look at the spear, and if you look closely, you can see a little metal pin where they added it in, right in the middle. In fact, I often use this pointer in the archive. If anyone's come down, they'll see me point and kind of you know play air drums with this. And I kid you not, while researching this, I realized that this is the tip of the spear. I went up there and it fits perfectly in that. And for the last you know eight years of my life, I've had no idea what that was until I started to research this. So, you know, since the Edwards Room was a dining hall, it became a library. And that's how I think many of you are gonna remember it. Here's the layout of the library. Uh, the Edwards Room, or the Rutledge Hall as we know it, was used as stacks in reading rooms. Here's a picture of the library in the 60s, a picture of the library in the 70s. You can just tell by the fashion, and a picture of the library in the 80s. And also, I love this one. In the back, in the mid 80s, when we got computers, this one's from 85. Here is our computer hall, the Apple Orchard, <clears throat> with, with Dave Tyson there working on the computers. Okay. So, partly, you know, since then, that went until 1993. So, from 1960 to 1993, it was a library. And I would like to get some people's opinions on, on how they liked it as a library. I know some of you recognize it as that. Since then, it's been used kind of sporadically. We use it as a makeshift mailroom, student center. It's been used for, it is used for formal dinners and receptions, greeting and registration center, and for formal dances. Right here is a picture of a dance. I think this is from the 40s, maybe the 50s. When you used to enter into the Edwards room, there was a stairway that went up to the second floor of Kyle. So this dance here depicts they would clear everybody out of the second floor and Penn Hall would bring all the girls down and Ernie Staley, who's my predecessor as archivist here, was the dorm dean of Kyle Hall, and he would set up blind dates and then they'd meet and then they'd come down and they'd have these formal dances down here in Kyle Hall. I think it was down here during a dance that we had maybe our most important, I don't know if important, we've had three presidents speak in this room, but our most, maybe our most, you know, our most known or our, our, our biggest moment happened in 1941 at commencement. And that was because the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra played our commencement dance. It's like a dance after the commencement. And for those of you who don't know Jimmy Dorsey, he was the biggest pop star of the 30s and 40s and i'm talking 12 number one hits and to put that in perspective taylor swift has seven not only that when he was here rocking out kyle hall he had the number one hit in america called amapola i'm probably mispronouncing that but 
he he had the number one hit on the charts the week he was here playing a concert for our students. All right, so now we've discussed the portraits, we've discussed the woodwork, and now we must discuss the Tiffany windows. And in order to discuss the Tiffany windows, we have to understand that Tiffany Studios did more than just the windows in this room. This man here is named René Theopold de Quillin, which I know I'm butchering that name, but he was born in Brittany, France. We're gonna call him René from this point forward. And he was a Renaissance man of sorts that dabbled in many of the decorative arts of his time. He worked for a few of the top artists in the, in the nation, John Lafarge, Augustus saint Gaudens, before he settled as the leader of the Tiffany Studios Decorative Arts. Rene was commissioned by Houston to create three separate features in this room, one of which no longer exists, and it is this. If you look, there is these frescoes, as they're called, which is not really wallpaper, it's like a different type of material, but he designed these. He designed those in some of those William & Morris kind of designs, and unfortunately, we don't have any detailed pictures in the archive of these frescoes, but these are the best I got, and I can kind of zoom you in so you can see what they look like, and not only did they line all the walls, they also lined the paneling that the woodwork crisscrossed the ceiling of this. In 1960, unfortunately, they were deemed fire hazards at that point. I'm not sure why um i'm not even exactly sure of the color of these this is the only color photo i have i originally thought they were green and gold but if you look at this color photo they look to be darker like a a burgundy or a dark green and i would love somebody on here I, this picture has got to be from the 50s there's the exit sign and there's a fan so i would like someone on here to uh to detail out whether or not what color and what they looked like a second great feature we have from Renee, and I absolutely love this, is this mosaic in front of the fireplace. Uh, you can walk right up to it. In fact, you can stand on it. It's, uh, it's the Mercersburg family crest. Um, and not only did he design this mosaic on the ground, uh, Renee, he designed the, the glass around the fireplace and actually the andirons, those iron andirons were done in Tiffany's studio. But now we're gonna to have to finish, which I think is the most distinguishing feature of this room, and that, that is the windows. This is the Princeton window. Notice that the name Princeton is slightly off kilter, a bit of a reminder that over time, stained glass windows warp and they have to be reset and maintained about every 100 years. Uh, but this window here is donated by Rodman Wanamaker, who was a classmate of Dr. Irvin's at Princeton. If you know that name, yes, Rodman was the sole owner of the Wanamaker stores, which at the time was the single largest retail store owned by a person in the world. He was connected to Mercerburg in a number of ways, which would be an entirely different talk and one I'd love to have. But for this room's purposes, it, it, it can explain why certain windows were chosen. And, and the reason these windows were chosen was quite simply, these were fundraising opportunities. If you were willing to pay for that window, you would, you would pay for a little bit extra and as a way for this building to get funded. And it was a way for these people to get their, their colleges honored throughout, throughout the, the room. We, we have 30 of these windows and many of these crest, they did not even have a crest. Rene had artistic um, freedom on these, and you can really tell. Uh, a closer look, and before we go into a few of the windows here, the reason Tiffany windows are so important opposed to uh, the more uh, medieval style is that glass. If you look to the left, that green and white glass, that's called opalescent glass. You know, it's just milky, it's kind of a, a mixed color scheme. That type of glass actually re reflects a little bit and refracts the light instead of being completely translucent. That glass was invented by John Lafarge and patented by Tiffany and is a major point of contention in early American stained glass. Uh, major critics that were opposed to it and they wanted traditional pot metal glass was Ralph Ams Cram and Charles Connick, who many of you know are the brains behind our chapel. And here is another advantage of the glass. It creates this painterly style. If you look close, you can actually almost see brush strokes across it, which is, you can't do that with a pot metal glass. Um, here are some examples of that glass 
the pop metal from the chapel. It's it's just it's a little bit of a different style. It creates a jewelry, a, like a jewel effect to the glass. Um, but it's truly a rare treat to have a campus and you can have such fine examples of the two major styles of stained glass <clears throat> in the early 20th century in America. So let's go down to the windows. One thing that Rene also did, besides I said he's a man of many talents, he was a metal, he created metals also. And I think that some of these windows, the ones that he created in particular, he did in the style of a metal. There's multiple, and these are just a few examples of those metals. You got the Columbia, or no, you got this New York University, you got Dartmouth, you've got, it's not working, there it is. You got Columbia on the right. And these are, these are really awesome, and you can get right up on them and see these amazing details. But I honestly think Tiffany Glass is best known for its colors. And I think we have some brilliant examples. These are a few of my favorites. The West Point window, I think just the color scheme is amazing. Michigan is maybe my favorite with this oil lamp. And then we've got William and Mary with that motif, which we see in the carving behind us of that sun. There's three or four times that appears throughout, throughout the room. And finally, um, I want to go to our crest and I put it up next to Michigan for a reason here. If you look at this and you see the Michigan stained glass window, you see that opalescent glass that has those kind of combining of colors. And when you look at ours, ours doesn't have that. Ours almost looks like a painted piece of glass. Um, I don't know if light comes through that. It's, it's actually put in a place where light can't come through it. Um, the Via Crucis Via Lucis does not look the same craftsmanship to me as the rest of these. This window is claimed to be done by Tiffany, and I doubt that that is true. And there's some merit to that based on this alone. Rene, we did not have a crest at this time, and Rene designed his own from Mercersburg. And this is the only example I have of it right here. And that's the M and the A of Mercersburg that was to be our crest in 1900. And I know Dr. Irvin didn't like this. Um, he felt it was too modern and didn't have sort of his belief system that he wanted out of uh, our crest. And um, I also know someone on this call had ties made in the 1970s with this emblem on it. And I still want one of those ties. You know who you are. So when it comes time, don't forget your pal Doug down in the archive. I want one of those ties. So that's, that's it. But I'm going to end on my favorite window, which is the Lehigh window. It's like this love of reading mixed with sunshine window. And read a quote here by Dr. Irvin. This is a quote from when Dr. Irvin, uh, uh, this was the opening of Kyle Hall. Mr. Kyle and the many friends that have contributed to this handsome building have created a new era. The future will see erected on this campus only such buildings as are substantial and beautiful from an architectural point of view. The ideal Merseburg boy is fun, loving, truthful, athletic, studious. Kyle Hall adds one more quality to this ideal, namely the devotion to the beautiful. All right, and we made it through. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> it was amazing. And I, I know we have some time for questions and story sharing. And uh, Mr. Price, not to put you on the spot, but I'm wondering if you recognized any of your uh, classmates from 1945. And you're on, I'm going to have to, Denise, can we unmute Mr. Price? I'm going to have to ask him to unmute. There we go. He's talking away. Mr. Price, can you unmute? There you are. Am I on now? Yeah, you are. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I did recognize several. But I remember the dining room with the, everybody wearing suits and ties and the great food. And I gained two inches one year just eating the homemade bread with the gravy. It was great. But th th we call that the Mercersburg 20 now. That happens when new people come to Mercersburg. Do you, do you remember? Do you remember the, the 
Tiffany wallpapering, frescoing, do you remember what colors those might have been? No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> it's 80 years ago. <laughs> hey, Doug, that was hey, wonderful. Walter. Hey, thank you. And, and I'll send you something for it. There it is. I've, I've been wanting that for years, Walter. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I don't know how long it's been since I've worn a tie. <laughs> Last time you were here, Walter, when you came to the archive, you had that tie on. I don't know if you remember that. And I, I, that's when I first said, I want that tie. So uh, I greatly appreciate it. It will get in an envelope tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's great. Walter, do you remember, because you were a student. Oh, um, there's a, a question in the chat. Doug, I seem to remember a story about the, about the two women's colleges in the windows. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just, it's just one, right? It's Wilson is... The only one, I believe. Yeah, Wilson, uh, the, uh, Harrison, like the, the story behind that is, again, this was a fundraising drive and they called a home of alum that had actually passed away, uh, sent a letter to the alum and uh, the wife who got the correspondence uh, sent a letter back and said, you know, my husband, husband has passed, but he, you know, Mersburg meant a lot to him. And I'd like to donate a window, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna donate a window of a male college. I'm gonna donate a window that I graduated from, and the and the school she graduated from was Wilson, and so she donated in honor of her husband the window that she graduated from, which is great that we have it because that was our sister school for decades. Well, Penn Hall and, and th that whole area, that campus was a uh, was something we we're closely affiliated with. Jen, Jen, this is David Franz. I have a question. Yes. Hey, yes. The, the, I think you said 1960 was when it, the, it stopped being a dining hall, but I don't think that can be right. No, no. 1967. <clears throat> Sorry, 1967. Okay. Yep. I, yep. That was just a mistake. But I yeah. was going to say, there was no construction on campus in my time. <laughs> yeah. Now, David, David I, I think he said 1960 is is when they took down that uh, the covering on the on the wall. Uh, I thought he said when it stopped being a dining room. I got no, you. No, but yeah. but uh, can you re you were in school when that covering was still up? You were class of 59s. I was a student when that covering was. Up. I can't remember the color. Can you? No, not at all. Yeah. Okay. I did see Jimmy Walker in the uh, one picture, though. Yes. Who yeah. already looked old in that picture, and he was still there when I was a student. Yes. And when I was back, uh, he he was ninety three when he was born. <laughs> uh, the the coverings were taken down in the sixties. The same time that the the steps that lead up to Kyle Hall covered the windows on the sides. That was, ah, okay, that was yeah. where they did all the yeah. fireproofing of Kyle Hall. There's um, another question in the chat. Do we have any photos of what the kitchen in the basement looked like when they were busy yeah. making meals? We do. Uh, I did not include them. Guys, I'll have to be honest, and Jen knows this, I had to like trim this a number of times. This, this original talk was well over an hour and it still went 50 minutes. Um, I actually can probably share. Let me, uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have it on this computer. It's on my computer down in the archive. We, we do have pictures uh, and it was a pretty cool functioning uh, kitchen. And we have pictures of like the white coats going in to get the food. And there was, there, some of them would help with the cooking. One cool white coat story I didn't know, and Walter, I, I wonder if you know this, you probably do, that for generations, the white coats would etch their names into bricks on the outside of what's now Rutledge Hall facing south. And if you come here and you come around the side of Kyle and you look up about eight, nine feet, there's just hundreds of, of initials of white coats that went through generations. I don't know if that was their little secret thing they did, but it's it's pretty neat. It's way up too. It's like twenty feet up the side of the building. Hmm. I was not aware of that. Hmm. 
there's a comment in the chat that says Ford Hall opened in the fall of 1965 ending the use of the Edwards room as the dining hall and fall of 1965 is also when white coats ended. Mm. That sound right? Well, a wearing of the actual white coat because we still have white coat and blue coat, but they don't wear coats. Um, you know, I, that's, it's, it's funny when, when Lee Owen, who's on this call, put together the 125th magazine, we tried to do a little research kind of, of, of the history of the white coat and I, I don't have it. So, I mean, HUD. Well, here's somebody saying, actually yeah. we had white coats fully starched in 1972. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you guys would actually then, be able to that better than me, I think. The, the role of white coats that uh, David knew that I knew as a student and when I was first teaching, uh, they were the scholarship students, mm -hmm. all right? They did not eat with the school. They simply waited on table and then they ate separately. Uh, and it's my understanding that um, after there, there were black students, Bill Fowle was very uncomfortable with the fact that every time he walked in the dining hall, any black students we had were there wearing white coats. It just looked like the worst of things about typing. And so he said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. And so scholarship students continued to work and we did that. I'm not sure it happens today, but I believe that was the right thing to do. That uh, you were given, uh, you, the school was giving you something and you were given an opportunity to do something in return. But the jobs were uh, in a variety of places and they might've been working in the kitchen or something too, but there were jobs all over the campus. But the waiting on table was not done by black boys in white coats and others. It was, the waiting on table was, was shared by everybody. Right. And that was a healthy change no matter what. But uh, before that time, the white coats were, I don't know how many people on this call were scholarship students. Yeah, the white coats, um, they were a special group. I mean, and the head waiter was a, was a special person. Um, so they had a clique. They also tended to be better athletes than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, wait, excuse me, I was a waiter at another school, Walter, and what you just, uh, this is Ron, uh, yeah. what you just <clears throat> described uh, was the case there also. There's not much light on your face, Ron. I didn't know who was there. I'm, <laughs> I'm hiding in the dark. Right. Well, when, the, when you when the name came up, but the voice, I knew who it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi, everybody. It's, it's Bill Gridley uh, speaking. And I, I just want to say, hey, Doug, that was an amazing talk. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jen, thanks for putting it together. And Walter, I miss you so mm. much. It's good. I think Barbara's it's, it's, there too. It's good to see your face <laughs> for you too. David Johns. I mean, there's so many people who want to see him on. There's so many people I want to say hello to. This is just really a moving and, and significant evening for me to listen to. Well, it's great to see the two of you. Uh, hey, listen, I want to give you a perspective from a child of the 60s, though, on the Edwards Room. And when it was a library, I graduated in 1969. Mm -hmm. And um, my favorite thing, which I, I've always loved that room, and I've been there so many times, even, you know, throughout my life, my kids have both been at Mercersburg. I've been doing buildings at Mercersburg. It's been yeah. an inspiration to me. But in the 60s, what was special about the Edwards Room to me as a library is it was the place I could go and pull a Jimi Hendrix actually sneak a sin. I, I could go, <laughs> put headphones on and pull out a, you know, a Mozart from the library <laughs> and put Jimi Hendrix on instead on the LP uh -huh. and listen to Hendrix. It was John Brick. I see you on here. You know as well as I do. <laughs> that was the, the Edwards Room was a rocking place back in the sixties. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we, we really did need another library. Um, it was it was not all it needed to be as a library. 
And as part of the building that was going on at that time, we also wanted to get, um, you know, when I, when I was a student, we had the shacks and we had classes in 88 and we had classes in Main Hall and we had classes in Laux. And so during the academic day, you walked all around the campus. It's a wonderful place to walk around. And I didn't re recognize it when I was back teaching and Irvin Hall was there and the stacks were gone, the shacks were gone. But I realized that when I got back as head that what students did is they walked in the doors of Irvin Hall in the morning and they never came out. They just went up and downstairs all day and then go to dinner or go to lunch. And so part of the idea with the, uh, with the building that was done uh, building a library somewhere else and putting an academic department in it using the, the old kitchen uh, for classrooms. Uh, all of that repurposing was deliberate in part to get people moving around again. And I remember when somebody said, well, what are you going to do with, with the Edwards room? I said, we're just going to let it be itself. We'll just take pleasure in it. Uh, we did, you know, if you'd have cooked up any particular purpose for it, you would have had to ruin it. And so we said, Just let it be itself. And That's Doug, you really helped it be itself this evening. Thank yeah. you. Yes. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I do feel, Walter, that yeah, we did. I wish more kids were in here. We use it for study hall and kids come through it a lot, you know, so they get that sense of history and the aura of the room but i wish i wish we could find a way to use it a little bit more for the kids um because i do think the library like you, you know like bill was saying would have been just a neat place to come and quietly contemplate read listen to records were the records bill right below the the counter is what it looked like to me like yeah, they yeah. were well yeah. you had to go in and you, you had to check a record out to play it but we didn't have backpacks back then, but uh, somehow we smuggled in these LPs. <laughs> but you're right, you know, so I think from, from my perspective, that was a, you know, kind of a, all right, it wasn't about listening to rock music in the library. It was about uh, being in a majestic space that really you, you felt so pr profoundly pr connected. I mean, it was just an amazing space, always has been. And now, don't I, you I, use that space I, now for small readings and-, and we, we, I mean, ba Barbara, at one point we had, we had a little bit of some furniture in here, but I mean, honestly, right now what we use it for is, uh, I, think it's, I think it's ninth grade study hall, uses half of it. Um, we do have talks in here occasionally, you know, formal dinners, which I'm sure you've been to. We, we still dress it up for that. But no, largely we don't. We don't. Yeah, we don't have a, a, a routine situation. Um, even when I was dorm dean of Kyle, we had like a piano down here and kids would come and play the piano and it was a little more inviting. I, I don't know. I think we need to get back to that. That's just my opinion. No. Yeah, there's a little stage at the one end, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Think of ways to use that. Yeah, yeah. They used to have a piano and, and kids would play. You walk through here and a kid would be playing the piano and it was just, it was just like, it was awesome, you know? Yeah. So it's a, a few minutes after eight o'clock. We had promised to only keep you for an hour, although I know everyone is enjoying this conversation. So if you don't have to leave, we can talk probably for 10 more minutes, Doug. Would that be yeah. amenable to you? And there's there it, and if you don't feel like staying, you're we're welcome to say goodnight. I know Doug in the chat, there are a lot of people who are expressing their gratitude and saying thank you for such a wonderful talk. Um, there is a question about butter pats on the ceiling uh, <laughs> and if that was anything that contributed to um, perhaps the removal of those beautiful tapestries. I've heard those stories. I don't know if that's, there's any truth to that. You know, did, did anyone throw butter packets on the ceiling that are on this call? Um, Will they well, admit it? I, I admit it, but again, at another school, so I'm not guilty of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> I admit it. I was there in 1965 and we did it. <laughs> there we go. I've, I've also heard stories that the tablecloths were so starched that you could 
pour water or milk or some kind of liquid in and create a little trough and sort of go around the table and find whoever you wanted to dump it in their laps, which just sounds terrible, but I guess high schoolers are pranksters. John Dobbs is nodding. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of thing he would do. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions or stories they want to share about the Edwards Room? Uh, I've got to. Um, Doug, I'm disappointed that you didn't mention that in the carving behind you, the dog that is bringing down the wild boar is a Weimaraner. Oh. <laughs> I, I at first, I at first <laughs> think to myself, well, it looks like a Weimaraner, but it has a long tail. And I did the research, and sure enough, Weimaraners, when they were bred on the European continent, it was for it was for big game. But as they ran out of big game and they became more of a bird dog, they started cropping their tails. So mm -hmm. I know, as the fourth four-time owner of a Weimaraner. I know Walter and Barbara can appreciate Weimaraners also for their, from their family side. Anyway, yep. I, just, I just had to mention that, Doug. That detail will now be told every time I, Thank I you. point out the board. I, I'll put it in an email tomorrow to remind you. <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I actually wondered about that dog. I was looking at it really closely and it's, 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 I don't know if anybody can see it. It's in between the boar and, and the horse. It looks, oh, you're talking about the one right on the boar. Okay. Yes, yes. So Ron, right to the left of it, there's yes. one that, that appears to be getting trampled I, by, by the horse. You know what? I, I saw that for the first time tonight. Uh, yeah. I've always been drawn to the one that's pulling on the side of the boar. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, everyone, if you're not a Weimar owner owner, I just had to add that. <laughs> uh, one thing we did had to do to the room uh, <clears throat> in the midst of all of that, abandoning it and you repurposing the kitchens and building things was we had to do something with painting the, the walls. Uh, and uh, Jim Snyder, who was an alumnus on the board at the time, how many people here know who Jim Snyder is. He was a uh, <clears throat> deputy director of the Museum of Modern Art and then he was the director of the Israel Museum. He's back in this country now, retired. But he put us on to a really curious guy named Donald Kaufman. Uh, see if you have that in the records. He's okay. a, he, he does paint colors and he makes his own paint. He mixes yeah. his own paint uh, okay. and he came down and he looked around, studied the room, and he gave us a paint color. He didn't apply it. He gave us enough paint to paint it. Um, they're very expensive paint, but it was, it was very deliberately created to be on those walls. Okay. He stayed with us at North Cottage, <clears throat> and in his car, he <laughs> drove down from New York he had all these, uh, what do you call them? The, the things, little dolls that bob the head? Yeah. Oh. The whole, the draft, <laughs> dashboard was absolutely full of them. And so was the back window. It was the most curious thing I've ever seen. Oh, oh. He's a strange guy, but he's, uh, you, he, uh, you, you have a book of his on yeah. color, right? Yeah. Um, he's, a, he's very well known. Well, what's his name again, Walter? Before? Donald Kaufman. Kaufman. Okay. He does all the paint for the Museum of Modern Art now. No, but I will. So see if there's any record of, of that little experience. Oh well, I'll look it up. Yeah. We don't have pictures of him in his car, unfortunately, but he was happy. He was a piece of work. <laughs> yeah. Bill, do you know that name? Bill Gridley, do you know that name? <laughs> Donald Kaufman. Painter. Uh, paint designer. Sorry. No, I don't, Walter. There are a couple of comments in the chat. People are sharing some stories. Charlie Bell shares that there was, he doubts there was much color to see because of the grime of decades of kitchen smoke. Um, at the time of the transition from the dining hall to the library, it was thought that the chandeliers were made of iron. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And that he was told someone questioned that. So a workman climbed up a ladder and began rubbing the chandelier with brass polish and voila, years of grime and oxidation melted away. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess there were also two uh, library shuffles. There was, I guess, the, the shuffle from Irvin to Kyle uh, that you brought the books to. I ca you carried the, vol the, the volume of the library, the volumes. Um, and then in 1993, the Lenfest shuffle, where everything was carried by students to the now library. And there was a shuffle from Main Hall to uh, Irvin Hall. Okay, there you go. Doug, we should include the shuffles in the well, future talk. It, it was actually one, it was part of the talk that was cut, actually. And, and I didn't know this, but the original dining hall, do you know where that was, Walter? the original dining hall. That, that was actually hard to find, but it, it was in the basement of Maine. Apparently they had a dining hall in the basement of Old Maine. So the dining hall came from Maine to here to over there. I did a whole like bit where I was kind of doing the, the uses of this space and their history and that that got axed, you know, from, from the speech. There's really cool pictures. I, I can't remember, I think it's the 60, the late 60s one, Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't it set some type of record? Wasn't there some type of record that they claimed that most volumes moved in a day? Like it was like a world record of movement, um, which might have been just like the Merseburg News being exaggerating. But uh, <laughs> oh. there, there was something like that, you know. Um, Ross Lillard shares that he was a working boy from 66 to 70 and worked his hours every weekend in the library with the kind librarians Amy Culp, Rosie Bell. And One of my great treasures in the archive is three cassette tapes of Amy Culp uh, detailing out stories of Mercedesburg in her voice, you know, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. She does you know, she tells all these stories from, she, she was the, she was a faculty kid, right? Wasn't, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, was she like, from the beginning all the way through, you know, it, it's great stories. She tells a story about throwing butter packets onto the roof of, of Edward's room and a lot, a lot of great stories in her voice. It was done in like 82 or three. So she was, it was toward the end of her tenure. Well, Doug, we should also consider adding audio uh, because I, I just downloaded some Jimmy Dorsey uh, so that I can listen to that tonight. But that's, inc that's an incredible story. I'd never heard that one. Yeah. There's a guy there. We have a little snippet in one of the uh, cool. quarterly. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But we have a snippet of a guy that couldn't get in to see the concert because it was seniors first and his upperclassmen on down. But he came to the side window over here and was able to like get right up on the ledge and he watched like the Jimmy Dorsey concert and he talked about what it was like watching it from the outside of the building. Wow. And then Jane just posted Donald Kaufman's website there. So that, that's, that's another cool story. And yes, there will be a link available for this recording. We'll post it on our website and send it out in our follow-up communications. But it is now 8.15. So uh, I think we'll say good night and give Doug one more round of applause for an amazing- Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for coming, guys. It was great. Thank you, know. thank you all. Top shelf. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you all for coming and being with us tonight. Thanks, Jen. Great. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Walter, for being on the call. Great to see you, Walter. Great to be here.